Oh, so it's going to be one of those sort of videos then. I have no idea what you're talking about. It's a Reese and Reads video. I'll be reviewing Five Year Sentence, The Master and Marguerite, Some Tame Gazelle, Breasts and Eggs, Dangerous Liaisons, and I'm talking very quickly because I have 16 books to update you on and you probably have a dentist appointment to get to. Or as we like to say in Australia, I'm not here to fuck spiders. I'm dropping the five star rating system and instead every book will be classified as either killer, that's anything from good to well, very good, or filler, that's anything from I enjoyed this read, but it was basically forgettable to I actively hate this book and want to set fire to the author. You mean novel? I'm not sure I always do. That's enough staring amorously at the eight-legged arachnid. Let's pass it over to me in a completely different room to discuss Maggie O'Farrell's Hamnet. Nell and I buddy read Hamnet with booktube's leading Shakespeare expert and fan, Olivia Savannah. From it doesn't matter what your tastes are in novels, you'll have something in common with Olivia, one of the best booktube channels out there. And this was one of those great buddy reads where we all noticed different things and the conversation we had really added to everybody's experience. Hamnet does have its fair share of praise. It won the Woman's Prize, the National Books Critics Circle Award, the Delkey Literary Awards Novel of the Year. It was shortlisted for the Walter Scott Prize and longlisted for the Andrew Carnegie Medal in Fiction. And to top it off, it just won the booktube prize. It is more than well received by everyday readers and book critics alike. But did it live up to the hype? Did it? Well, it wasn't playing no Barry White music to an octo-eyed web-habiting floozy. O'Farrell produces an absolute masterclass in how to write. How to write sentences, characters, scenes, emotions. I'm in absolute awe at how O'Farrell uses so few words to create such a rich text. Maggie, how did you do it? Well, don't you think it's just lazy to put a wig on every time you want to play a woman? Some women, for example, Maggie O'Farrell, aren't even blonde. Okay, okay, I have an idea. Maggie, how do you make your writing so rich? I render in an entire kilogram of butter into each copy. O'Farrell uses the finest quality fair trade gluten free vegan butter. Finest quality because every inch of text is amazing and fair trade, gluten free and vegan because nobody can possibly object to the book. Isn't butter already gluten free? Not if it's made out of wheat. Hamnet is the son of Agnes and an unnamed but very successful Elizabethan playwright who for the purposes of this video we'll just call Kit Marlowe. Why do we spell playwright with an I-G-H-T and not an I-T-E? That's probably how Marlowe spelt it back in the day, and it just caught on. Agnes was an equivalent name to Anne and Hamnet for Hamlet. Hamnet's twin sister Judith has a mysterious illness, which is almost certainly the plague, and Agnes is determined to save her. And it's these three characters and their older sister Susan who are central to the plot. Marlowe's really a side character, and later in the novel doesn't really factor into the plot at all. With their clever prose, twisted tropes, and reassigned character archetypes, O'Farrell is really writing back to Shakespeare. You mean Marlowe? Thank you, indeed. She's really writing back to Marlowe. And there's no better demonstration of this than the main character, Agnes. She's a witch, and that doesn't mean she's foisted onto a set of scales next to a duck, but in a few effortless lines, O'Farrell creates this wise elfish forest creature who is strong and fierce, but is also kind and intelligent. My only criticism of this book was that it shouldn't have been called Hamnet. Like another award-winning novel published last year, it should have been called Agnes. This novel has deeply feminist themes running through it and really captures the characters who aren't Marlowe. But in a way, it all does come back to Marlowe, the sacrifices Agnes, an incredibly brilliant woman had to make for her husband. And not just Agnes, Marlowe's life can almost be summed up by the Galileo quote, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. That quote is from Kepler. Actually, the quote is attributed to John of Salisbury in the 12th century by the scholar Matthew Levi, and you've misused it. Marlowe's career isn't built on his wife's knowledge, but on her labour and sacrifices. It's her shoulders he's standing on, and those of Susan, Judith, Bartholomew, Eliza, and many more. 
This book has strong themes, characters, plot and setting, but it is the writing which enables it all. It doesn't just enable it, the language is the star. The chapter where the plague is tracked back to the source is a completely pointless chapter which I normally would have objected to, but I could just sit in a Farrell's wonderfully crafted prose. While not writing poetry, she is conscious of her metre and flow. Every sentence just sounds good and there's a real buttery beauty to her wordplay. I don't really like books where the beauty of the writing isn't just a bonus but the star, so it's a reflection on just how well executed this novel is that I loved this book. And it couldn't be more of a killer if Bent Volio screamed a pox on both your houses. This is not just a killer, this is a generationally good book. I read this book both physically and as an audio, and while the audio book is excellent, I would highly recommend reading the physical copy to get the best experience. Some Tame Gazelle. What should we have for lunch tomorrow, Harriet? Lunch isn't the important question, Belinda. I want to know why you've been cast in that blonde wig. Oh, this thing? I'm sure it's nothing. It's not nothing. It's not nothing at all. It's inaccurate. You're clearly an author, insert character Belinda. Barbara Pimms had auburn to chestnut hair. Almost similar to Maggie O'Farrell. It certainly wasn't similar to Maggie O'Farrell's wig. Well... It's a lot closer than this Anna Nicole before the surgery costume they've got you in. If that butter peddler can get her own wig, why can't you? Let's leave it alone, Harriet. The question on my mind is, what should we serve for lunch tomorrow? Haven't we already discussed this, Belinda? Cauliflower cheese. But is cauliflower cheese enough? Should we not add something to it? Maybe a grain? Which grain would you like to add, Belinda, dear? Oh... I don't know, maybe we could add some meat. Roast the chicken we have. But if we roast the chicken, what will we have for dinner? Harriet, what if she's a vegan? Belinda, we're two middle-aged women in the 1930s in rural England. Vegans don't exist yet. Then why is the local greengrocer selling Maggie O'Farrell's finest quality certified vegan butter? Barbara Pym's debut novel, Some Tame Gazelle, may have been published in the 1950s when she was 37. However, Pym's wrote it when she was in university when she was only 22 years old. A 22-year-old deciding to write a novel about two unmarried women in their 50s is unusual. But what's more, Pym imagined herself and her sister Hilary as the main characters, just 30 years older and living together as spinsters. And this turned out to be a prediction so accurate that if Pims failed as a writer, she could have fallen back on a career as a clairvoyant. This book doesn't bother introducing the characters, instead places you smack bang in the middle of the plot. It tells you not to dawdle, to please leave the spider alone, she's got a headache, and instead expects you to pick up who the characters are so quickly that if you fail, it can leave you feeling lost and disoriented. As a result, the characters can be hard to relate to, and the tension and comedy missed. However, then it all just clicks. Because the last thing anybody could criticise Barbara Pims of is not being able to draw a good character. This novel is packed full of them. They're distinct and different, and when the plot throws characters together in different situations, you start to be able to predict how they will react. There is such a joy in anticipating what will happen. It's like somebody telling you that there's another spider joke coming in seven seconds. You watch and wait in delight, and Pims needs her excellent character drawing skills because nobody is catching spider syphilis from this novel. The excellent characters are backed up by some light-hearted wit and humour, and suddenly, like in the best comedies, even though the plot is both ridiculous and pointless, you start to care if the cauliflower cheese lunch is a success. There is also the constant literary references. Some Tame Gazelle is a line in a poem, Something to Love by Thomas Haynes Bailey. Belinda and Harriet's last name is Bede, a nod of the head to the venerable Bede. And this book is just packed full of hidden Easter eggs. And there is a glory to the way that these references aren't important to a reader's understanding to the story, yet they still add something to the novel. This is exactly the sort of novel that will mature upon re-reading. Thank you to Booktube's biggest Pims fan, Sean the Book Maniac, for recommending that I start my Barbara Pims journey with this wonderful novel. It won't be my last because Some Tame Gazelle is a killer. <laughs> Another one of my favourite booktubers is Kevy. She ran a readathon for her favourite novel, The Great Mistake, by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. As Kevy says, Mary Roberts Reinhardt is the American Agatha Christie. Because she writes crime fiction, carries a gun and puts cheese on everything? Even her cauliflower.
Did someone say gun? Unfortunately, this book just has too much going on for me. There was just way too many characters for my secondhand brain to keep track of, and figuring out who the murderer was became impossible. But that's not the book's fault. You're still not sure who killed OJ's wife. Shut up. Everybody knows it was her chic bodyguard in the Golden Temple. I failed to guess the murderer. But unlike an Agatha Christie novel where I just guess everybody, I was still figuring out how everybody fit together and hadn't guessed anybody when the mystery was revealed. On the positive side, there was a number of interesting characters in this novel. Maud was particularly intriguing and I loved the surprise mozzarella in the middle of the novel. But this book is an interesting example of how it's not just literary fiction that can go over my head. And for me, it's a filler. This shouldn't put you off this book if you're interested. Almost everybody in the group chat loved the book. And my reason for not getting on with the book is my inability to process enough information at once. This is honestly something I am terrible at. Dangerous liaisons. Letter number, is anybody really counting? Madame de Torville to Cecile. Dear Cecile, I can't tell if the Vicomte de Valmont is in love with me or just thinks of me as some sort of arachnid in lace and lingerie. But let me tell you about this incident with the cello. It was something like this. Blah, blah, blah. Lots of unnecessary words that don't portray emotions. Blah, blah, blah. Just watched the movie with Glenn Close, John Malkovich, Michelle Pfeiffer. That's me. Uma Thurma. That's you, Cecile. And apparently a young Keanu Reeves. Hell, watch the remake with Buffy the Vampire Slayer. This novel tells the tale of one man's disingenuous pursuit of a young lady at the request of his former lover who conspires with him. Yeah, that sounds like a realistic scenario. And is often sold as a sexy novel, which is a really problematic way of saying something's rapey. Not that a novel being rapey makes a book bad if there's a point to it. But there's nothing to excuse the 240 years of book reviewers thinking consent was a turn off. Epissary novels take some skill to get right. And there's skills that Pierre Chocolate with Lactose or whatever he's called doesn't possess. It's a real pity that this 1782 classic predates Jane Austen and her popularisation of free indirect speech, which would have been a much better device than the long-winded letter structures that Guy de Milk Candy used. Say what you want about Austen's novels, but books in general were a whole lot shitter before her. I DNF this book before the famous rape scene. It's a filler. And last... This novel is so good that it leaves the killer category and goes straight past Homicidal Dictator and lands itself in the Dark Lord's bookshelf. The novel is about a very distinguished and refined cat named Behemoth who visits Moscow with all of his friends. And coincidentally, people start buying things with the labels on soup tins. Somebody gets comically decapitated by a train. You'll laugh. You'll cry if you know the man who lost his head. But... Don't worry, he starts to talk later in the novel and you'll find he's far more interesting dead. The cat is so amazing, even Jesus is a side character. When all of this goes down, the cat is unjustly and rudely accused of causing it all, despite having a watertight alibi. Oh no, it wasn't me. I was eating pickled mushrooms and playing chess. They're all like, no, it's your fault. And Behemoth continues to politely protest his innocence. I like guns. <laughs> And then Satan gives Behemoth a Medal of Valor for bravery, which has never before been given to a demonic cat. And there's a few less Moscovites around, which means there's more pickled mushrooms for me. Sorry I'm late. The door was jammed shut with lint and catnip. An unfortunate accident, I'm sure. But don't worry, I've filmed the review. So you've told them the devil is visiting Moscow and causing all sorts of chaos? I think you find that you've used the wrong pronouns. Master and Dark Lord are Master's preferred pronouns. Fair enough, we need to respect everybody's pronouns. Did you mention the retelling of Faust but turned on its head? And that it's also the story of Jesus Christ told from the point of view of Pontius Pilate? I did mention Jesus. Have you gone through the main characters? I've mentioned all the important ones. You've explained who Margarita is? Main character? She's not even a complete pizza! She is one of two titular characters in titular. this novel. Should I be discriminated against because I'm wearing clothing? She should learn to dress herself. That's not what the word titular means. But she's kind of unnecessarily naked for a lot of this novel, isn't she? Nonetheless, it's a weird thing for you to criticise her for, considering you're not wearing any pants. 
It would be ridiculous for a cat to wear pants. The Master and Marguerite is a masterpiece of confusing literature. It combines fantasy with satire, hilarious in an incredibly Russian way. You really are laughing when people get decapitated. That's because decapitation is funny. There are also strong themes around religion and philosophy. It's hilarious and packed full of references. For example, Incomplete Pizza Lady being naked around Master is a reference to nudity and knowledge in the Garden of Eden. Wasn't it just gratuitous nudity? Gratuitous nudity always has a point. Such as boosting sales. This book has lots of elements. Margarita is asked by Satan to host a party. The love of her life, the master is missing. There's a guy doing black magic and predicting with some accuracy when people will die. For some reason, we keep getting updates on Pontius Pilate. Naked witches are flying with broomsticks. There is an insane asylum. And Azazello, a demon who can shoot anything by bending space, is in town with his friend, a massive cat called Behemoth. That's me! Behemoth really does steal the show with his slapstick antics. You're drawn to him as a character through his utter foolishness and cowardliness. My tail! You simply want to ask him, say at last, who art thou? I am part of the power which eternally wills evil and eternally works good. Which brings us back to what this book is talking about. Are Woolen, Alzalo and Behemoth even evil characters? Do they even do anything other than reveling in chaos? Belgakov takes the Faust quote and trumps it with his own quote. Manuscripts don't burn? That's a great quote, but no, I mean, would you kindly ponder the question, what would your good do if evil didn't exist? What would the earth look like if all shadow disappeared? After all, shadows are cast by things and people. Here is the shadow of my sword, but shadows also come from the trees and living beings. Do you want to strip the earth of all the trees and living things just because of your fantasy of enjoying naked light? Is the light gratuitously naked? You're stupid. Such disrespect. No. That's the end of the quote. And this is the end of the review. The Master and Margarita is a killer read. Time to speed things up. Trilby. There are four things interesting about this novel. It was the fastest selling novel in Victorian England. George de Maria is the grandfather of Daphne. A style of hat is named after this novel. And this book introduces us to Svengali, a problematic figure, both in the novel and in its representation. It really is quite a racist, anti-Semitic depiction. Some of you will have observed that of the four interesting things on the list, one of them wasn't the book itself. That's because it really is a very poor novel. It's not even good enough to be a filler. The Red Sphinx. The sequel to The Three Musketeers, the one that follows Cardinal Riccolo and not D'Artagnan. Dumas wrote this 20 years after The Musketeers when he was broke and needed some money. And you can tell, it wasn't translated for a long time until somebody wanted some money. And you can tell. Dumas is one of my favourite authors, but this is a filler. The Canterville Ghost. An Oscar Wilde play making fun of Americans and a ghost sounds brilliant. And there's really not a lot more than this summary. It's a super quick and fun read if you've got nothing better. It's not bad, but it is a filler. Father and Sons. In 1862, this was a groundbreaking novel dealing with the new topic of nihilism and a weird character called Bizarroff. A novel famous for being the first, but well short of the best. It's a filler. Brown Girl, Brown Stone by Paulie Marshall. I read this 1959 classic with Elle from the channel Elle Thinks, who has a wonderful channel which you should all subscribe to. Seriously, she's undersubscribed and she's brilliant. This is a coming of age novel about Selena, but it's also a novel of the relationship between Selena's parents, Scylla and Dayton, a relationship which could be described in a number of ways. One of them not being happy. Scylla's relationship with both of her parents and her sister Ina are explored and they all offer something different and complex. Feelings of love are contradicted with rivalry, disappointment, resentment and even hatred. Coming from Barbadian stock, the family have to decide if they're black or Barbadian. A source of conflict between Scylla and Dayton. One of the things I love about this novel is how everything interacts. Marshall is able to write about family relationships, belonging, money, religion, race, and sex without ignoring how those things might interact with each other. 
And while being a very socially critical novel, it also creates a snapshot in time around these brownstone apartment buildings, which creates an isolated setting in the heart of New York. The themes, characters and settings are complemented by interesting plot and nice writing, and it's a very competent novel. I won't say that it's perfect or that it couldn't have been better, because it wasn't and it could have been, but it's a novel which is greater than the sum of the parts, and it's still an absolute killer. The Red Tent a retelling of the biblical story of Dina, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, the Red Tent not only picks a minor character and gives them a voice, it really makes a novel woman-focused in a way the Bible just isn't. The Red Tent is the name of the tent the women sleep in when they're menstruating, and this symbol is used to both show the mistreatment of women by men, but it's also used to show how women interact and the coming of age of a girl into womanhood. I don't have a lot of negatives to say about this novel, but if you're going to retell a Biblic story, commonly decapitate a Russian. And if you're going to write historical fiction with a feminist twist, try to render an entire kilogram of the finest quality vegan butter into each copy. There's nothing particularly wrong with this novel, but in comparison to other novels, it really doesn't hold up. There's nothing I can point to and say, I loved that. Did I enjoy this novel? Yes. Does that mean it's a killer? No. This novel is the very definition of filler. It adequately held the spot between other books without distracting me from them. The Cider House Rules. John Irving's 1985 novel deals with abortion, adoption, unconventional families, belonging, rape, domestic violence, and is a quite complex novel, portrayed in an effective and easy to follow style very similar to Steinbeck. Much like The Red Tent, I don't have a lot of negatives to say about this, but it was just lacking comical Russian decapitation. I was thinking, Behemoth, what if the Russians were to slip on some of the finest quality vegan butter? Maggie, that's genius. I'm attending this party later on. You'll need to apply this ointment. Behemoth, stop trying to steal Maggie O'Farrell's soul. It's just a little party. She has her free will. Everything about this novel is the kind of book I love and I have no constructive criticism. It's a good novel, which I enjoyed, but it's lacking that X factor. It doesn't stand out. And as a result, it's a filler. Complicity. Ian Banks has written a weird literary thriller here. Cameron Colley is exactly the sort of privileged snot it's so easy to hate. Snorting lines of coke, drinking way too much before he drives, blacking out, doing cannabis to control the coke, and then coke to control the cannabis. Playing a lot of computer games. And fucking somebody else's wife. In some really detailed and weird ways. One might call the sex scenes gratuitous. Gratuitous bondage is probably just a bible reference you missed. I don't think it's that type of book. Going back to Cooley, our narrator is as unreliable as he is unlikable, and there's a murderer on the loose, who appears to be a vigilante killer. Rapists are often raped before they're killed. But something is really off. Are they really vigilante killing? Is everybody bad? And we're never really sure if Cooley is the killer, or just some unlikable idiot caught up in the plot. Somehow, amongst all this, Banks is able to include some very American psycho-esque critics of capitalism. But what Banks is able to do that Eaton Alice couldn't is engage you with the plot by not endlessly repeating himself. Except when it comes to computer games, which could be compared to Bateman's obsession with Peter Gabriel's drummer. But is this book any good? Well, it depends on what you mean by good. The literary part of this thriller is, well, naff. I agree with what Banks saying, but it's not very nuanced, complex, or indeed interesting. However, the novel is much more thrilling than it is literary, and that part really is engaging. The characters are well-crafted, and the plot is nice and twisty with lots of mystery. I was completely entertained, and that's why complicity is a killer. The Night Watchman. You don't need me to review this book. You just need me to say that there was a rubber-suited sex mer oxen in this novel, and whatever I say next is completely irrelevant to your purchase choices. I DNF this book right at the point a dog started to talk. Why does literary fiction think that it can get away with talking dogs? It's weird, and I'm not reading that nonsense. I'm very grateful you don't have the same hang-up about talking cats. Erdich didn't even comically murder Soviets on their way to the ballet. A disgraceful oversight. So despite the rubber-suited sex mer oxen, this book is a filler. I read this novel in January and thought that it was problematic, trans or queer phobic. There is a scene in an Elgore's bathroom with a butch woman or trans man. It's left ambiguous and the woman is yelling, get out, you don't belong. 
However, I must have vagued out over a few lines because those lines are not directed at the queer character. Instead, the scene is quite a powerful one with our protagonist questioning her role as a woman, which is a lot of what this novel is about. The novel explores a woman's place in society through two issues, breasts, one woman's desire for a boob job, and eggs, her sister who narrates the novel's want for a child. These two issues are told separately eight years apart. A deeply feminist novel that has similarities to Kim Jeon, born 1982. This is a novel that knows exactly what it wants to say and it's compelling. This 2019 novel is based off Miko Kikikami's 2008 novella. The novella being completely rewritten and a second part added to make it into a novel. And this maybe explains my experience because the first part is superb. It works on its own and it doesn't need the second part. And the second part is not up to the standards of the first. While it might seem like it's expanding on what the first part did, the novel has already said what it wanted to say in the novella, which means the second part, which is the longest part, is surplus to the novel. The first part of the novel is all killer, but the second part is filler, meaning that ultimately this book doesn't work for me and it's a filler. Miss Hawkins is retiring. She's eaten all the food in her cupboard except three tins of tuna, and surely this can be reused. There's nothing left but to kill herself. An excellent plan! I recommend firearms! Or, or, standing upon a moving train just before it enters a tunnel! I could calculate the height so she instantly decapitates herself upon impact. How tall would you say she was? Is she Russian? Of all the methods of suicide, you would recommend decapitating oneself on a moving train with a tunnel? Comedy gold! And if she films it, think how quickly the video would go viral on YouTube! Yeah, I can't contradict that. YouTube viewers are a little sick in the head. Upon retirement, Miss Hawkins is gifted a five-year planner. A completely unsuitable gift for somebody planning on ending one's own life. Things are no longer in perfect order. The thing about this novel was I was really expecting an emotionally charged, poignant read about a depressed, suicidal woman. Horrible and miserable. My favourite genre. But this novel has a whimsical, almost Wodehousian feel to it. It doesn't take itself very seriously. My other favourite genre. But then, this novel still is emotionally charged, poignant, and all of those things I already said. Horrible, miserable. Train decapitation. I didn't say that. You should have. It should all be a mess. Those elements shouldn't work together. But yet, they really do. Except for the decapitation. That is a lie. That's the delusion of a homicidal cat. This book is a total killer. Now it's time to reveal my killer of the video. I'd like to thank all my murder victims, Satan, Azazello, and most importantly, myself. No dear, you didn't win. That's right, I'm just so impressed with what Maggie O'Farrell has created with Hamnet. I mean it when I say that this book is generationally good. I think it will still be in print 100 years from now. My book is still in print and it's almost 100 years old. As I've already said, this is not a Scott book, yet I still loved it. But did she actually kill anybody? You know it was about the plague, right? No animals were harmed or harmed anybody in this video. No spiders were impregnated and for your own health and safety, don't borrow my wigs. They've never been washed and you might get pink eye. Maggie O'Farrell's Vegan Butter is a registered trademark and cannot be copied or reselled without written authorization, especially in Canada. Be aware of imitations. If you like these silly video reviews, please click up to see me waterboard myself while reviewing Piranazi and down to see me review Great Circle while holding a small couch above my head. If you made it this far in the video and you don't know what to write in the comments section, please tell me your favourite thing to put inside a taco. It seems somehow relevant to this video. Uh, likes are on special today. They're now half price, so please make sure you like this video. People who aren't subscribed to this channel will be visited by an enormous psychotic demon cat soon. Bye.